There, I guess this meeting is being recorded. Um, so uh, let's one moment. Uh, so this event is being live captioned by White Coat Captioning. Um, to view the captions during the event, click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Then click on the show subtitles option to view the captions on your screen. You may also view a full page text of the captions by clicking on the link that will be posted in the chat box below. Uh, this will open the captions in a separate browser for you to view. So welcome to this Spotlight Gallery Artist Talk with Pat Music. Uh, the Vermont Arts Council recognizes that we gather here in Indakina, the traditional and unsurrendered homeland of the Abenaki people. So please join us in acknowledging their history and ancestors, their enduring presence, and their future generations. Now, Pat Music is a Manchester, is an Albany-based artist who creates sculptures, paintings, and drawings from natural and human-made materials to express the relationship between mankind and the environmental, and the environment and the tensions we exert upon each other. In her virtual exhibit for the, for the Vermont Arts Council Spotlight Gallery, Pat shares work inspired by the space program and created over 25 years in collaboration with her late husband, astronaut Jerry Carr. We're going to start with some remarks from Pat, including a brief video, Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot. And then after that, we'll have time for a Q&A with the audience. I'm going to turn it over to Pat now. Welcome, Pat. Thank you, Desmond. <clears throat> and, and thank you to the Vermont Arts Council for inviting me to be a part of uh, this wonderful exhibit program. Um, I, I'm just thrilled uh, to be here with all of you tonight. And thank you for uh, my many friends who have uh, come via uh, the computer to, to be in my living room um, and visit with me. In 19, oh, pardon me, I need to t tell the latecomers, I have this thing uh, with my nose. It's either a cold or an allergy and my voice is not uh, its usual self. Um, and I also sneeze in the middle of talking, so forgive that. In 1973, I found myself walking in the meadow beside our house on top of a hill in Brooktondale, New York, carrying a heavy blanket, which I spread out on the grass um, and looked up at the clear black sky, waiting to see Skylab. I had heard that day that it was going to be flying over the Finger Lakes area. And uh, I had had a long time interest in space and wanted to see the lab, uh, what I could see of it up, up in the sky that night. So I lay down on the blanket and waited until in the west a light appeared and I watched it arc over me. And I said, I wonder who those guys are up there and what they're like. And six years later, I married the commander. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, while I was down on my blanket, Jerry Carr was up on the, in the lab, traveling at 15,500 miles per hour and orbiting the Earth 15 times a day. He saw 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets every day. But his favorite <laughs> view, he often told me, was when he went on an EVA, the extravehicular uh, activity or a, a skywalk. And when he had a, a few minutes rest in his 10 hour day out there um, on the lab, he would hook his feet into the, the brackets on the side of the lab and lean back and look at the earth. It was his favorite thing to do, and he loved the 
loved the views. He was able to see um, nature at her best and her worst. Uh, he saw hurricanes destroying um, land. He saw volcanoes spewing toxins into the atmosphere. Um, he saw uh, uh, soil being swept by rainstorms down rivers and emptying into the seas. And he became, um, he later claimed, an environmentalist at that, at that moment. Um, eventually, Jerry and I met um, six years after his return, or no, pardon me, four years after his return. Uh, when I moved to Houston uh, to teach at the University of Houston satellite campus at Clear Lake City, this uh, campus was actually in NASA's backyard. Uh, and I was quite excited about um, the opportunity to learn more about uh, a topic I'd been interested in since John Kennedy uh, urged America to land on the moon by the end of the decade. Jerry and I met in church uh, at, under the good auspices of what we called the Presbyterian Yenta. She was a lovely lady who sat in the choir and decided that the astronaut in the front pew and the newly widowed, widowed woman in the back pew needed to get together. Um, so she invited us for dinner. Neither one of us really wanted to go. Um, we started out uh, each at the end, opposite ends of a seven or eight foot couch. But by the middle of the evening, we were in the middle of the couch, um, discovering that we came from the same hometown in Santa Ana, California. I'd gone to the same high school, sang in the same church choir, went to the same university, went to the same beach haunts and hot dog stands. <laughs> but I was six years older than he, so I um, uh, did not meet him, except for the occasional times that he was in my nephew's home because my nephew was his best friend. Jerry and I married and, <clears throat> and moved to Arkansas and built a wonderful home. And he flew his little plane from Huntsville, Arkansas to Huntsville, Alabama every week to work. And I went to work in my studio. Um, it, it was an idyllic life. Um, but it was it had separation and eventually um, we knew we wanted to do some kind of work together. I think the germ of that idea occurred at the United Nations in 1970 when Jerry, and, I'm sorry, 1990, when Jerry and I were invited uh, um, uh, along with other astronaut and cosmonaut couples, I believe there were 50 of the spacemen and women uh, who attended. Uh, and um, the audience sat um, with simultaneous headsets. So we were able to understand what was being said uh, on the dais. Uh, they had commissioned six of the astronauts and cosmonauts to speak in their own language and to talk about how they felt looking back at Earth for the first time. Um, Mary Cleve spoke in English, and we all also heard German, uh, uh, French, Russian, Spanish, and Arabic. When it was all over, Jerry rushed down into the audience where I was sitting and crying, by the way, um, and said, what did they say? And I said, you're not gonna believe this, Jerry, but they all said the same thing. 
they all talked about the beauty of the earth, the fragility of it, our need to protect and care for it, to be good stewards of it. And they all used the same words. And the tears were streaming down my cheeks because this was a validation of a feeling I, that I had had for years that as human beings, we have common deep level connections um, and, that, and that they may be um, hard to, to reach or express, but that they are the same. And of course, in Psych 101, I was taught uh, about individual perceptions and nobody sees anything the same way. And, um, and, and so I was very happy to have this validation by these people who had looked at the stimulus of the globe and seen the same thing and were able to express it. Um, it was interesting that uh, at that same time, two months earlier in 1990, my friend Carl Sagan um, had requested of NASA that as Voyager 1 reached the outer limits of our solar system, uh, the cameras on it be turned around and a vision of Earth um, be taken. Um, Carl was um, a, a friend of mine at Cornell University when I was there as uh, the wife of the football coach and the mother of three, three daughters attending schools. And, and um, he, he made a very deep impression uh, on me, particularly in terms of how I defined my religious experiences. Um, I'd like to show you uh, the result of those cameras turning around and photographing Earth. It's a three minute clip called Pale Blue Dot and uh, is part of, of Carl's book, Pale Blue Dot. If we could have the film, please, Desmond. <coughs> That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Sorry about that, let me try again. Uh... Is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. That should be it. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, 
lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. That's, um, that's pretty amazing. Um, the, at the moment that last shot was taken, um, Voyager 1 was 4 billion miles away from Earth. Well, I knew from that experience and from the United Nations experience that I wanted somehow to express um, this, this need that we have that is so great to protect and care for our fragile home. And yet the images wouldn't, when I went to the studio, just wouldn't come. I tried and tried. And then finally had to push it to the back of my mind, thinking, you know, in a few months I'll, I'll be at it. But it took 20 years before those images finally arrived. And in the meantime, Jerry had retired from his space work and was no longer flying back and forth from Huntsville to Huntsville. And, um, he came into the studio and became my engineer and my fabricator. A lot of the work that I was doing um, was uh, beginning to incorporate the use of steel. And so I had a great need for a welder and Jerry had always wanted to learn to weld. So he 
was thrilled about that. He loved to make things with his hands and he fell very uh, easily into the role of studio assistant. But um, it wasn't very long before he was Jerry Carr artist. Um, along with making art over those 20 years, other series of art, uh, we traveled a lot. We had uh, the privileges, the great privileges of uh, seeing some of the, the finest ancient art in the, in the world. And one that stands out uh, in my mind and my heart is Lascaux, France, where I received special permission from the French government as a teacher to be able to be one of the five people a week that could go into the real cave. They have um, a, a man built cave uh, on the property that's a perfect replication, uh, but nothing like the real thing. Um, as we went through a series of chambers, um, sort of debugging ourselves literally, um, standing in a pool of formaldehyde, which ruined our shoes, but uh, that was okay. Um, we were in total dark, um, letting our eyes adjust to uh, the darkness of the cave because each chamber is lit by only one small incandescent bulb but it's enough light to see the, the absolutely amazing and beautiful things that um, long ago were created on the walls. Using uh, the thing I hadn't expected to see was the three dimensional aspect. And uh, that was of very great interest to me because I was sculpting. and. Um, the uh, the people who did the drawings, we don't know if they were men, women, or both, uh, used the bumps and, and curves, uh, the cracks in the walls uh, to as part of the expression, as part of the line of, of um, the figure they were drawing. And the figures were these magnificent prehistoric um, animals largely, um, running, jumping, uh, trying to escape from hunters, um, which were also depicted in, in stick figure form, uh, <clears throat> while the animals were pictured in full muscular um, strength and power uh, and grace and, and beauty. The purpose of these uh, artworks, we do not know whether they were, were religious in, in nature or whether they were to guarantee success in the hunt. I like to think <clears throat> that they were an expression from the hearts of those artists um, about their feeling about nature um, and that um, they, uh, they had a relationship with these animals uh, that was life preserving um, and, and a direct line to a relationship with the entire world that existed around them. Uh, as we left the cave, I, I stood in the outer chamber by the big door and as the door slid shut across my vision and <clears throat> there was only a thin strip of light left and suddenly the bulb went out and the cave was returned to 17,000 years ago when the art was, was created. Um, so the, all, all of these experiences uh, uh, in our travels fed into 
uh, the the work our fragile home and and my feelings about, about uh, uh, the earth and and nature. I thought maybe um, you if you've seen the virtual show. <laughs> excuse me, um, that's at the Spotlight Gallery. I would uh, spend our time showing you slides of a few of the larger pieces and point out the ones that Jerry um, helped, helped me create. So if we could have the slides, please, Desmond. This um, is okay. <laughs> this is a slide from our fragile home. <laughs> it's about uh, five and a half feet high, um, and it's a nine-foot quilt. Um, it's made of paper, Japanese kozo paper from the mulberry bush, uh, and it contains fibers from the the mulberry plant. So it has a great, great strength to it. Um, it um, moves from the floor over a quilt stand. Uh, I was influenced there by uh, a lot of, of the antique shops in Vermont where you find these wonderful quilt stands draping with handmade quilts that are 200 years old. <clears throat> um, on it um, are printed words. Um, I've, I had uh, messed around in my head with all kinds of symbols and shapes and forms, um, searching for the right way to express, uh, the right way for me to express um, uh, my feelings about our fragile home. And finally, during the latter part of the 20 years, I began to think of the words that the astronauts and cosmonauts had used and thinking of the shape of the words and the shape of the letters. Um, eventually, I tore the words apart and, and um, used only, only letters. But in this case, we have uh, the words and we have <coughs> the translations of the six languages. So I have 48 words here, excuse me. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. This one is um, called Raindrops Keep Falling on My Soul. Again, I used Kozo paper. Um, it's a paper that I use frequently because I love its direct association with that mulberry bush and its roots in the ground. Um, it's torn into strips uh, and um, then um, taking a cue from Andy Goldsworthy, I, I built uh, platforms to place these strips on, <clears throat> soak them in with water, and then flooded them with a pewter acrylic paint. And then I could take the platform and tip it in different directions so that it would cascade down like rain on a window pane. Um, Jerry built the um, support system for this that you see at the top, the steel brackets um, from which the panels hang. And it's a really nice effect if it's in an air conditioned room, it blows and moves slightly with the, the blowing of the air conditioning so that it comes to life. Next slide. Oh, that piece was 12 feet long. 
This one is 35 feet in the semicircle. It's one that Jerry did, did not participate in the making, the creating of, but uh, he, he certainly lugged it around on a trailer to a, a large number of venues who wanted it for exhibition. It's called The Guardians, and it's in the garden, a sculpture garden at uh, Southern Vermont Art Center right now. Um, it's um, loose leaf for me, anthropomorphic. It, it's, um, it represents the, the spirit, um, the spirits uh, who guard the forest and uh, and and keep um, the disasters away. Next one. This piece is called Great Circumstances, and it is a tribute uh, to the early Native Americans, although not the Vermont tribe. Um, this was um, a tribute to the Ohio mound builders. And um, if we could shift it up just a little, is that possible? Um, it's a series of uh, musical instruments um, in a circle, encircling a, a very large stone. Um, and it, the, the, it's in a loosely um, uh, interpretation, a loose interpretation of Stonehenge. Uh, I was, that was one of the spots we visited <laughs> that also was just absolutely mind boggling in terms of its, its beauty and its history and its strength. Next slide. This one is called Harvest, and the setting is uh, grounds for sculpture done in Hamilton, New Jersey, uh, where I participated in a show, <coughs> a sculpture exhibit of um, a women artists. And um, it's kind of a rather obvious um, uh, chopping of the, the uh, corn stalks in the fields. And it was inspired um, uh, by a trip that we made in Colorado in, during the harvest season. Um, and it's about uh, three and a half by three and a half by uh, th three and a half by. Um, Jerry did not participate in that one either. Next slide. Uh, Ra, the sun god. Uh, this one is nine feet in diameter. Uh, the rays of the sun are from uh, limbs of oak trees in Arkansas. Uh, one year we had a tornado uh, sweep through uh, the farm of a friend of ours. It cut about a half mile swath that was a couple of hundred yards wide. And he said, how would you like to harvest some oak trees? <laughs> and um, he brought these to me and we cut to them into the various lengths. I, uh, uh, he stripped the outer bark from them and I sanded each one four times and then waxed it four times. And the inner disc is uh, four feet across. And um, it's named after the Egyptian uh, god of the sun, Ra. Next slide. This one Jerry did. Um, Almost all the work on, um, I took the design to him uh, as I frequently would and said, how do we make it work? And he would um, 
figure the structure of the pieces out and and then uh, set about uh, welding them. Each one of these squares is a little table and it has four legs that goes back to the wall about two inches. And so he welded each one of those legs to those squares. It's loosely based on a hurricane, an image of a hurricane uh, that he showed me that was taken from Skylab. Um, the copper strands, um, which are a little hard to see, uh, represent the rain within the center of that storm. Next slide. Or is that the last one? I guess um, that's the last one. Um, along with making visual art, Jerry and I also wrote a number of books. Um, do we have slides, Desmond, of the books? Um, we don't, unfortunately. Okay. Um, All right. Um, you, can, you can find those books on my website, which is patmusic.com. If, if you're interested, and I know a number of people in the audience already have them. <laughs> so there is no end to this discussion. Much like Lasco, then the art of Lasco, um, it goes on and on and on. Um, art is an incredible way to. Um, that we use as human beings to express ourselves uh, and, and to communicate. Um, and in this case, the thing that we are, are, are trying to communicate um, is this sense of fragility, um, the loneliness of, of Carl Sagan's pale blue dot. Um, and our need, uh, we are the only ones who can keep it alive. Um, and and um, so the, I, I feel the lessons um, that, that we learn from looking at past art um, march along with us through our, 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 our lives and beyond. Each of us, I feel, carries within us the capacity to create, um, to take creative action, um, to use creative thought, uh, and to solve problems creatively. It doesn't matter if you're a taxi driver or a school teacher or a farmer or a doctor or an artist. You have this within your genetic makeup. It's part of the way that we survive this ability to <clears throat> make creative decisions. And, and so those decisions affect the next generation and the next generation and so on. And it's my hope that as time passes, that, that we solve those problems in better and better ways. Thank you so much for joining me. If I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to try to do it creatively. <laughs> Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes for questions and answers. So feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand if you prefer. Um, go ahead. Pat, uh, this is Tim Crawl. Um, that piece that Jerry did, the last uh, slide, what were the dimensions on that? Oh, I didn't give that to you. Or roughly, well, I mean, you yeah. said they were little tables. <laughs> Yeah, the little tables are four inches by four inches. Okay. The piece is roughly, I would say, about eight feet. Um, 
in width and maybe five feet high. Okay, because you threw me for a loop when you said tables, because I wasn't sure if it was little tables or medium tables. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't be sorry. Anybody else? Hi, Pat, Steve and Jill here. We're just uh, glad to be here and it's great hey. to see you. You look great. And we're just uh, so honored to have a couple of your pieces in our home. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so honored. Uh, Steve and Jill Worth um, from Florida. Um, they own two pieces from our fragile home. And, um, and Jill, I still have the piece you bought to auction. <laughs> So don't forget, don't forget that's right. that, please. That's right. Oh, we forgot about yeah. that. Thank you for reminding us. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you, Pat. Great to see both of you. Well. Thanks for coming on. Sure thing. Hey, Patrish. This is Uncle Steve. Steve. Hi. 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 Uh, the, uh, the tables, do they have a specific significance as tables, or is it only relevant in terms of the geometric shape making the path of the hurricane? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I, they were necessary to give the dimensionality that I needed and the distance away from um, from the wall, I needed those legs. But the table to me is uh, a very, very important aspect of life. Um, it's, it, uh, it's where the family gathers, it's where so much uh, support and, and sustenance, um, so much love. Love is a big word associated with table. And I learned it from my first mother-in-law, the gift of food that she made with her hands. It was the only gift she had to give uh, to her family. And, and um, so the table has great significance and maybe at an unconscious level, I, um, I use that form and I have to. <laughs> Uncle, Uncle Stevie gave me this. <laughs> he, he is a clown uh, like you have no clown you have ever observed. He's a, a fabulous artistic. Uh, Monolith in Vermont. I, I think he's a special tre state treasure. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so, so in some ways, my subconscious is thinking of table and the power of that storm, and of course the power of the spinning Earth and the rising of uh, heat and moisture and and that and what Jerry saw from outer space that that storm, that uh, tornado, that hurricane is sweeping all the tables in a sense, just it becomes a force to sweep all the tables off the earth or off, off the landscape. And so that then, I'm glad you reminded us of the Thanksgiving table and all of that. So that kind of ties together that uh, symbolic shape all these tables being it's sort of like it's not a general table it's oh my gosh that's my table that's getting swept away yeah yeah that's good very good <laughs> i told you he was a genius <laughs> thank you for the for presenting the nose oh my goodness that's wonderful <laughs> it's on my desk <laughs> oh <laughs> Nice, thanks. You're welcome. We sure do miss uh, Bonnie and I, we sure do miss Jerry. Um, I, uh, I have so many memories, especially three stones and both of us almost dying on the ice trying to get from the car to the <laughs> restaurant. I remember. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, geez. Mm -hmm. Any more? Well, Pat, it was wonderful seeing you. Thank you. And uh, we, we, we love you. Well, I love you all. I thank you for, for joining. I'm just so excited that you came from all parts of the country to participate this, after, this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. I guess I shall end with, I don't say goodbye um, from my love of Italy and my years of traveling there. Uh, I, I picked up the word ciao, <laughs> which means see you around. <laughs> ciao. 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 Ciao, Pat. Love Ciao. you. Ciao, Pat. Love Ciao. you. See you soon, we hope. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> Happy to see it. Looks like you're settled in. Well, I am. You need to come see me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll plan that. So we'll um, uh, post a recording of this. Uh, on the exhibit webpage. And Pat, I will send you a link to the recording when it's ready. Thank you very much, Desmond. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story and talking. It's just been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah.